The first person disappeared on November 5th, 1990. That was my first case, and the PD wasn't alerted until it was too late. The victim's wife came in, barging through the front door of the police station, desperate, crying that her husband never came home from work last night. My partner knew her, helped her calm down a little. She was absolutely sure that something was very wrong with her dear old Earl. She could sense it in her heart, she told us. Soon after that, we were alerted by another local that there was a pickup truck crashed into a telephone pole in the outskirts of town. We didn't even have to check the license plate because we knew it belonged to Earl. There was blood splashed on the steering wheel while the hazard lights were flashing on and off in a manner that that reminded me of someone sending light signals from a faraway place. I immediately formed rescue parties and started searching for the now missing man for three straight days. It looked like Earl simply vanished out of thin air and he was nowhere to be found. Poor Mrs. Johnson. They already lost their kid two years back and she was left all alone in a world of confusion, despair, and sorrow. The boy was born with malformations and didn't make it. They cared for him, they nurtured him, they loved him so very much, but those... Those things were simply not enough. He simply gave up living, gave up the fight. Maybe, he, maybe he went to a better place. At least they gave him a name, Joey. I felt for her. I did. Earl never came home, and soon after that, things started getting really strange in town more people started going missing some few years later George who was one of the best plumbers I'd ever seen disappeared one night he was living alone at the time and people said that they saw him driving to the outskirts his car was never found he never showed up again in town people people assumed he just moved away without letting anyone know he just wanted a new life someplace else. Maybe he just wanted to start over. And again, no leads. Two years passed by and everyone forgot about George. We all went on with our lives. Our daily jobs, chores, like nothing ever happened. Nobody seemed to connect to the events at the time. I mean, people come and go all the time, right? Right. Some of the town folks said that they started hearing loud howls in the night. Like a predator animal was either finishing eating up its prey or maybe the hunt was, was just getting started. We ignored those because we thought that they were sounds made by the animals that lived in the forest or the nearby lake. I met Mrs. Johnson, or, uh, Emily, very late last night and realized it was exactly 30 years ago that her husband went missing. Oh, she was just wandering the city, probably 1 a.m. or so. Thought that we didn't do our duty properly. Like, I can only imagine how this woman must have felt like these past 30 years. You know, 30 years of hell. I was just leaving the station after finishing work in a small shop theft attempt. We got the kid fast, you know, he just... He wanted to steal some candy and DVDs. Told him he should stop it or he'll go to juvie. Offered to pay for some of the things that he wanted to steal. Let him off with just, you know, a warning. It's good to do good deeds because, you know, there's so much evil in this world. Even such a small thing like this might brighten someone's day a little bit. Emily looked startled when she almost bumped into me. She was carrying a gas canister, which seemed odd at the time. And I asked what she was doing with it. She casually flipped the strands of her hair from her face and she told me that she forgot to put gas in her car. It had an empty tank. She couldn't get it started. Why couldn't she wait till morning, I thought. I didn't ask her. I mean, what was the point of just going after a canister of gas this late at night? Anyway, I uh, I offered to take her home because it was late. It started getting chilly. She insisted that she could walk. Didn't rush anywhere. She wanted to feel the night air. Maybe cool her head a bit. I mean, who walks home for 10 miles? 
right? I, I told her that dangerous things are lurking in the night, even in a town as simple, small, and quiet as ours. I insisted to take her home. I parked behind her car in the driveway. As she walked in, I heard a loud noise in the house. I jumped and I asked her if everything was all right. It's that damn dog again. Sparkles, get over here, she yelled as I saw the golden retriever coming to greet her. It's a good boy. Did you flip a bowl again? You got Officer Buford here worried. Yeah, hey there, pup, I said, as I saw it coming towards me, wagging its tail. Aren't you a beauty? Take you home if I could, but you gotta watch him over Mrs. Johnson here. She asked me if I wanted a glass of water, which I kindly refused because I was... Well, I was very tired. I needed to get back home, take a shower, sleep a good sleep. I got into the car, and I backed up into the street. As I watched the house, one more time, I saw Emily turning on the light in the attic. The shadow started jolting in the dim light. That's where the dog sleeps, I said, right before leaving. As the attic all for himself. So, some people are weird, you know, but hey, who am I to judge? The next day I got into the station, Chris, my partner, told me someone went missing again. Jesus Christ, the hell is happening, I asked him. My voice shaky and feeling like I was lost in a maze, I couldn't find the way out. She was the seventh missing person in the last 30 years, all cases, cold. The person missing was the owner of the cafe in town. Nice lady, you know, by the name of Josephine Perkins. I mean, I remember seeing Emily a lot there, and they were probably friends, so I decided to go back to her house, ask her if she knew anything. Chris came with me, we got our cruiser, and we went to see her. I rang the doorbell, dogs started barking. Officers, how may I help you? Emily said, holding a cup of coffee in her hand. I told her that Josephine went missing. Her husband called in the station and said she never returned home last night. Oh, she came visiting yesterday morning. She only stayed for a half an hour or so. She said that she had business out of town, that she wanted to meet with a new coffee supplier, Emily told us. That's when we heard a loud thud in the house, exactly like the one I heard last night when I drove her. Mrs. Johnson, what was that? Is there, is there someone with you in the house? Chris asked. She told us blatantly it was probably the rats in the attic. They always come back. Poor old George found a lot of them. When he came by a few days before, he disappeared, and one huge rat jumped on his head. A loud thought again. Rats don't do that kind of noise, I thought. If that's all, officers, the food will get burnt if I don't get to it soon, she said. Visibly uneasy. Yeah, I, I want to check on what those noises are, ma'am. Please let us in. Okay? Just, let's, uh, just to make sure everything's all right. I told her. Our gaze is meeting like two sparks on a bonfire. She let us in. Chris stayed with her in the living room and I went up to the attic. The thuds grew louder and faster. I then holstered my gun and proceeded with caution. I asked if there was someone inside and I heard a howl. I kicked the door open. And the most despicable sight I'd ever seen beheld my eyes. There were human bones scattered all over the floors. In a rocking chair on the far corner, I saw... I saw the, the mummified remains of Earl, Emily's husband. I gasped, and that's when I heard a wheezing voice coming from a darkened corner. New friend here, Joey Happy, Happy... Happy, it said. What the fuck, I thought. I yelled at whoever was there to come out where I could see him. And that's when I saw a very tall, deformed man charging at me. His face was contorted into a sick laugh. His yellow, crooked teeth seemed rotten. The right half of his face was lower than his left, and spit was dripping from its corners. He looked like he'd been burnt, torn up, then sewn back up to form some sort of deformed man. He looked like a mix of two popular monsters. He, he started sprinting, hunched towards me, his left hand dragging onto the floor. It looked swollen, red, pus was coming from it in between the fingers. The sight was horrible. I heard Chris screaming, Fucking get off me! Help! Bo! He, she has scissors! Bo! 
The deformed man started charging at me, yelling, I want to play. I want to play Joey's new friends. <laughs> I like the friend. Friend named what? He said. His speech impaired. I understood right away who he was. Poor soul. Leave my baby boy alone. He hasn't done anything to you. Emily cried from downstairs. Then I heard a shot. And Emily screamed. Shit, shit. I turned around, and that's when Joey headbutted me to the ground. I lost my gun. He threw me against the wall. Play, friend. Play, friend. I love you, friend, he said, highly amused. I stepped on some bones and immediately felt disgusted. Earl was looking at me, his teeth showing inside of his lipless mouth, his eye sockets hollow, vacant, and dark. He died from a blow to the head, the, the blunt force trauma being fatal. Downstairs, things seemed calm. I got her, Bo. We fucking got her. You all right? He asked. I'm here with my new friend, Chris. Can you, can you come and say hello? Maybe show him your toy and what it does, I told him, hoping he would get the message. The deformed man started coming at me again. The stars filled my vision. His left fist connected with my jaw. I felt blood and pus smearing my face, and then he started smacking my head against the floor. I thought that was it. My last sight before I died was that of this, this, this... I, I don't even know what to call him. Monster, victim, accident. What what was he? Toys, friend. We have toys, too. He laughed and giggled as he took a femur in his hand and prepared to bash my head with it. I closed my eyes. And that's when I heard a gunshot. Emily scream. A falling body. Bo, oh, fuck's sake, man. Chris said. You're a mess. What the hell is that? I told him everything. We went downstairs where Emily was crying. We killed her kid. You took my baby boy from me. What's he ever done to you, you bastards? Chris had already cuffed her. We called the M.E.s. Back up, took her down to the station. She told us that her joy didn't die. She wanted him hidden from the world. She couldn't bear the thought of kids making fun of him because of the way that he looked and talked. So the decision was that he'd be kept at home, in the attic. One night when his father went inside to play, he bashed his head in with his bare fist. Then his mother faked the accident. She kept Earl home, and Joey would speak to him from time to time. George had been killed when he heard the thuds from the attic while doing plumbing work. He almost had an identical death to his. His car had been driven off to the lake by Emily so she can cover his tracks. Turns out that Josephine Perkins, the owner of the coffee shop, was actually out of town for that meeting. She called her husband the next day from a payphone because she lost her cell during her stay there. You can call it luck if you want. In two days from now, I'll adopt the dog. As for the other missing persons, the murder details are the same. Joey wanted some friends, but took things way too far, and his caring mother vouched for him. This was something that shook me to the very core, because I never saw anything like that before. And it'll haunt me for the rest of my life. That poor kid didn't know what he was doing. He just wanted a friend to play with. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I wanted to tell you thank you for listening to tonight's story on the podcast if you're listening on Spotify or do the, the uh, videos if you're listening on YouTube. And if you're listening anywhere else, then probably let them know that they're not supposed to have this there because it's only supposed to be on Spotify or YouTube or wherever podcasts go or, you know. I also want to give a very big thank you shout out to all of you guys out there on Patreon. If you guys want to check out patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta, you're able to support the show, uh, support me, support my cats, support, you know, uh, being being cool folks out there like people like these. Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chumpinski, Bobby Carmen, Nico Kyle, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Raven Hart, 1-800-Nightmare, King Hades F-13, Unknown Nobody, 
Joshua McMeekin, Michael Scarborough, Kazen, this is my real name, no shit, Jason VB Wilson, Infernal One, Little Wolf Gaming, Jimbo the Hut, Caspian, Jordan Niels, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Bradley Lipe, Ann Charon, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Brian Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Thomas Burgett, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much for your support on Patreon, like I really can't thank you enough. Uh, and everybody who's down there in the description, thank you guys so much as well. And everybody who's not on either of those tiers, who just have a dollar on Patreon, I, I really, I can't thank you guys, like, for making these these past 10 years incredible this this entire time i've ever spent on youtube on podcasting everything amazing and all of you who are at home listening thank you guys so much for listening i hope you all have a wonderful happy holidays and sweet dreams <laughs>